you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and place my finger in the mark of the nails, and place my hand in his side, I will not believe. Eight days later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them, and the doors were shut. But Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not be faithless, but believing. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now Jesus did many other signs of the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing you may have life in His name. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, your spirit has moved mightily amongst your people. That we have been called together once again on a Sunday morning around your word. And the tangible evidence of your grace in our presence. The holy sacraments. And so Lord... We pray that even as we spend this time together in your presence, that the Spirit would grow our faith ever closer to you, that we would believe your word and its power in our lives, that by believing that we may have that life, Lord, we know that you have breathed your spirit on us, not merely for our own benefit, but so that we could go out into the world. You send us there with the word on our minds and in our hearts so that we may share the good news with the unbelieving world that you have risen up from the grave. Help us to share that good news with what we say and more importantly with what we do. Now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, who is our rock and salvation. Amen. Please be seated. You know, the idea that Scripture has meaning in our lives is really played out in a lot of different ways. I recall the great Reformed theologian of the middle 20th century, Karl Barth, very intellectual man, but understood this principle uh, to be informative, especially when it came to preaching. And so Karl Barth would tell preachers, he'd say, preach with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. That was his way of saying, hey, make sure that it's not so cloudy and lofty that you're not speaking to folks in the pews and in their daily lives. Because here's the truth, the Word does have power in our daily lives. So that was his way of saying that. I don't know if he exactly said it just like that, but Karl Barth was known for having said something along those lines. Bible in one hand, newspaper in the other. Now, of course, he was, that was the middle of the 20th century. You know, newspapers were, you know, still that day's technology. Now, today, of course, it'd be kind of hard to have a laptop in my hand. Uh, And the Bible in the other, because, you know, that's how we mostly get our news, right? Now, I know some people hold out. Any any folks that just have to have the newspaper, right? There you go. See, you got, you know what? Here's the thing. I was, my first major in college was journalism, and there's something about having that black on your fingers, right? You know, I feel like you've you've done, you've accomplished something at the end of the day after you've, you know, spent the time reading the newspaper. We don't have, you don't quite get the same thing. I, I, I get my news from a lot of different sources. You have to be careful, right? 
You've got to be careful where you get your news from these days. Uh, that hopefully, you know, it actually is, you know, news. Um, and that it's real, okay? Um, so you have to be careful. I, I came across a couple of articles this week, though, that were particularly relevant to our, to our season, to our text for today, as I was kind of scanning through a, a variety of sources. And the first article I came across actually was from the Times of London, right? Good old-fashioned London Times, right? Now, the BBC, that's another one of those sources I like to get the news from, right? Yeah. I like, you know, to be honest with you, I'm a shortwave radio guy. I love listening to the BBC on a shortwave radio, right? It's kind of hard to do that these days. So, you know, but the BBC commissioned uh, a survey uh, of British Christians. And what do you think they asked them? How many of you believe in the resurrection? 25% of British Christians, not just general people in Britain, of British Christians didn't believe in the resurrection. 25%. It reminds me of a survey that was also done by another organization in the United States back in 2014 called Rasmussen Reports. They surveyed all of America, not just American Christians, people who self-identify as Christians, but in general, all Americans. The percentage of Americans that believe in the resurrection. Now, I, I, frankly, I was a little surprised. This seemed high to me. 64% of Americans believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Or at least that's what they said they did anyway. But the, the whole 25% of British Christians, that caught me off guard. Then there was another piece from the New York Times. Yeah, paper of record, right? All the news that's fit to print or the other way around. New York Times is, have, have a lot of great reporters, and one of them I have a lot of respect for, because I've read his work over the years, is a reporter uh, uh, by the name of Nicholas Kristof. Nicholas Kristof has written several books. He's uh, been overseas, uh, reported uh, most famously, uh, uh, was the New York Times reporter on the ground in Beijing uh, in 1989 uh, when the Tiananmen Square uh, incident occurred, and he was right there in Tiananmen Square. Uh, ended up marrying a, 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 a woman by the name, a, a Chinese uh, national by the name of uh, Wu Dun. Uh, Sharon Wu Dun is her name, and so he is uh, has been with the New York Times for a long, uh, for a great period of time, and, and written several books. So, he, but he's been delving into uh, Christian themes of late, uh, interviewing a, a prominent evangelical pastor uh, over Christmas. Uh, the most recent uh, interview that um, Nicholas Kristof did was with Jimmy Carter. Uh, and uh, he, he asked Carter if, basically asked him if a Christian, if you could be considered a Christian for believing in Jesus, but not in the resurrection. Kind of an interesting question. He starts the piece with this. He says, Christians, and this was written last week, says, Christians celebrate Easter on Sunday. But wait, do we really think Jesus literally rose from the dead? That's how he writes this piece. And I was taken a little back by that. So it sounds to me like Thomas isn't the only one doing a little doubting. He writes this question, or this is the question as it appeared in, the, in, the, in print. With Easter approaching, and he's talking to Jimmy Carter. With Easter approaching, let me push you on the resurrection. If you heard a report today... From the Middle East of a man brought back to life after an execution. I doubt you'd believe it, even if it were, uh, if, if there were eyewitnesses. So why believe account, ancient accounts written years after events? Now, I have to say I really did like uh, Jimmy Carter's response to that. You know, you know, now, we all know Jimmy Carter is a lifelong Baptist. Um, Sunday school teacher for years and years and years. Um, uh, but he came off sounding awful Lutheran in this one, I have to say. Uh, very, very, you know, very, not, you know, he did c tried to come across, not being very judgmental, uh, that it wasn't his job to determine if a person was a Christian or not. 
And he kind of sympathized a little bit. He said, yeah, I, you know, if, if presented with a story the way you put it, yeah, I, I kind of understand where you're coming from. But he says this, my belief in the resurrection of Jesus comes from my Christian faith. Faith. Not from any need for scientific proof. Therein lies, I think, the challenge many people today certainly Christoph and others, who struggle with this question. And I'm willing to bet that there are probably more people struggling with this idea than we might think. And the challenge for them is the challenge for many of us, right? You guys know the state motto of Missouri, right? The show me state, that's right. And there is a member of the staff who, going on nameless, says, I am from Missouri. I want to see it before I believe it. Now, generally, they're not talking about Jesus or the resurrection or things like that when they say that. But that's kind of how we generally operate, isn't it? The challenge of walking by sight and not by faith. It was interesting that yesterday, of course, was Earth Day in combination with the March for Science. I like science. Science has done a lot for us, right? But the question is, and and the truth is, what is science but the accumulated knowledge of human existence, right? What we have learned over time. I mean, that's what the word science means. You take it down into the Latin. I'm a Latin guy. I'm a Latin guy. Four years in high school. My mom made me took Latin. What's up with that? But anyway, I guess that's a, t- that's a question for another time. But I love Latin. Of course, what's the Latin? The word scientia means literally knowledge. Now, isn't science always changing? I mean, the, imagine the difference between how things were when I was a kid. Grew up in the 70s, right? My fir- hey, hold on to yourself, kids. My first video game was black and white. It was Pong. All right? Yeah, I see. You guys know what I'm talking about. I didn't have cable until I was 13. Right? I, I, I know that sounds harsh. I know. Right? Now, I, last night, I'm watching the Braves on my phone, on my phone, right? MLB.tv. It's good stuff. Technology, science, innovation. It's all great things. But here's the truth. What we know right now I mean, don't we understand that in five years it's going to be a little different? Because we'll have learned things. We'll have discovered things. Doesn't that also mean that there's a lot out there that we don't know? I love science, and I'm here to tell you, friends, I love Jesus too, and I don't think there's necessarily a conflict. But some people want to put science on the highest plane of all knowledge, and I'm sorry, but I have a problem with that. I, I am challenged... By the idea that human knowledge is the end all be all. And it's not. It's not. The things that we know now will look like silliness. I mean, you know, I was always watching those Star Trek things, right? No. It'll it'll look silly in in a hundred years, right? The things that medical science is doing today, the amazing things that medical science is doing today. I always like you know, listening to Dr. Leonard McCoy talking about how ancient medicine was, you know. And always comparing things to like bleeding people with leeches, right? You know, and, and at one point, you know, will they, will they tell us that, um, uh, you know, will, will doctors in the 22nd century think that MRIs were like bleeding leeches, you know? What, what will they be able to do then? God made science, folks, and I don't think they're in conflict at all. But the challenge is to think and assume that what the, the, the level of human knowledge we've obtained right now trumps this idea of faith. The idea of faith is built into our existence because we know that there are things that we cannot know. Right? Pastor Johnson says this all the time. How many of us were absolutely shocked that we woke up this morning? 
Maybe some of you, I don't know, okay, just, God bless you, absolutely, yeah? You know, I like it, works for me, yeah? Because, you know, in many ways, that shock makes us a little more appreciative. Hey, I'm taking, out, taking in oxygen, putting out carbon dioxide. Life is good, right? But the truth is, we, just, we, we take a lot of things on faith. The sun came up today. And was there anybody in this room that yesterday thought, don't know if the sun's coming up tomorrow? There's a lot of things that we take on faith. You know, isn't that the, that's the challenge that Thomas had in our gospel text for today. I mean, Jesus had told them he was going to do this. Right? He'd sat down there before him and said, you know what? I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and on the third day I'm going to rise again. <laughs> At that point, you know, they're all sitting there going, what's he talking about? And so now Thomas is getting the news, right? That Jesus did what he said he was going to do. Now, if I don't put my hands in a side, not, don't believe. Yeah. So does Jesus reject him? No. What does Jesus do? He reveals himself to Thomas again. And this challenge of walking by faith and not by sight. You know, it, I, I find it interesting that we're having this conversation about faith and belief in 2017. Right smack dab in the middle of the 500th anniversary of the Lutheran Reformation. And what was the cornerstone of what it was that Luther said? That we are saved by God's grace through faith. Wow. And what is faith? Well, the, the writer of the book of Hebrews helps us out with that one. Gives us a, a real handy definition for that. He says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And the conviction of things not seen. I've done enough funerals to know how powerful the word of Jesus' resurrection, his defeat of sin and death, how powerful that is in my life. And I know that you have that very same hope in yours as well. That there is a day when the corruption will not happen. Jesus will call us forth. And we will be with him in glory. That table which we just got a foretaste of right here. I can't imagine soul food bistro. Ha! Not even close. Although I'm going to imagine there's going to be some fried chicken on that table. I'm just saying. Talk about a foretaste of the feast to come. I can't wait. That's what I'm hoping for. To sit down at that banquet table with my Lord Jesus. And those great saints that have gone before me. And there's a lot of people I'm looking forward to bending their ear on. Starting with Jesus. And thank goodness it's all for eternity. Because I can't imagine not having enough time to ask all the questions. Right? Right? truth is that that is our hope. That one day we too will, will, find, will be with him in heaven. Do we know that's what's going to happen? Our faith tells us yes. Our hope tells us yes. Yes, Nicholas Kristof may doubt. Jesus' resurrection. 25% of British Christians may doubt. Even Thomas doubted Jesus, but Jesus didn't abandon them. He simply revealed himself again. Having seen the nail marks in his feet and hands and the pierced side of his Lord, Thomas believed. He said, my Lord and my God. Indeed. And that's what happens to us again and again as we come here, as we hear the word. As we share in this meal, Jesus reveals himself to us and our fear and doubt. 
And he tells us, hey, don't be afraid. And that call to reject fear is a call to faith. Because without him, without the word, without the promise, without the hope, there's a lot to be afraid of out there. But he has given us faith. And where does that come from? Oh, by the way, this faith stuff that we keep talking about. Well, we don't have to figure that one out. Paul helps us with that one as well. Because he says, faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? Famous journalists? No. Politicians? No. In fact, it is the word of God. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the words of Christ, who is the living word. Made flesh. So that reminds us, there is a clear relationship between faith and God's eternal living word. God seeks us. He pursues us in our faith, in our fear, and in our doubt. And he repeatedly comes to us in the word. And he invites us to come and believe. That's kind of the point of the very last verse of our gospel text for today. That Jesus does wonders and signs, amazing things, things hard to believe. Right? The gospels tell us things like giving sight to the blind, raising the dead to life, virgin birth, and Jesus himself rising from the dead. And these things are written, why? John makes that point. The gospel writers have recorded them. The church has passed them down from generation to generation so that we might believe. Have faith and in believing have life. Not just any kind of life, abundant life, eternal life. In his name. So the key for us the walk away from all of this today, is to be in that word. To develop a relationship with Christ through the word. Now, I'm sure many of you have experienced the same things that I have. That my faith grows and is bolstered and strengthened by being in that word more and more and deeper and deeper every day. And then when we haven't, we're like, man, I missed something today. I missed something today. So we want that seed, the seed of the word, to take hold. And the spirit to work faith through that word. So that means we're in the word. We read. We pray. We even sing the word here. That's what I love about the liturgy. Okay? That's what I love about our liturgy. We're even singing it. Hallelujah, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. And he invites us to take this word, to be refreshed by his meal, to be cleansed by the remembrance of the word with the water in baptism. I love the questions I get all the time. You know, they they walk up to a baptismal font and they kind of peer in a little bit, right? And they say, hey, pastor, what do you do different in this water that's different from anything else, right? You know, they're like expecting, you know, magical pastoral pixie dust, right? Or at the very least, a special bottle from Publix, right? I mean, only Publix is going to carry holy water, right? I tell them, no, sorry. I don't mean to break, you know. It's, it's, it's water. But it's water in baptism combined with what? The Word. Absolutely. Absolutely. So he invites us to take this, this gift that we get every week, this opportunity To share, to be in his presence, to take that out into the world. Because there's a lot of people that say, yeah, right, resurrection, okay, gotcha. How about some hope? How about some joy, right? That prayer of the day, I don't know if it spoke to you, but it spoke to me. Almighty God, with joy we celebrate the festival of our Lord's resurrection. Graciously help us to show the power of the resurrection in all that we say and do. That's why, fu- that's why funerals are important. People don't realize that, but they are. They're important because 
It is the church standing up and saying to the rest of the world, Death, you lose. We have hope in the risen Lord Jesus. And so we join our British brother, St. Thomas Cranmer, who said, called on, uh, on all of Christianity to read, to mark, to learn, to inwardly digest this word, to feast on the word, which is what we do in the Holy Eucharist. To feast on that word. And then having been fed, take it out into the world and share it with them. It is faith brothers and sisters. We are saved by faith. And we are blessed because we believe, yet we have not seen. Let us invite others to join in that great gift as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take a moment to reflect on that word and the power it has.